Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Cynthia Tulin Wilson, and I'm here today with Dr. Francis Etheridge. We've done many interviews before together, and today we're going to interview him on a new book, Lord, Do You Mean Me? A Father Catechist. How are you today, Francis? Uh, very well, thank you. Uh, would you like to begin with a prayer, Cynthia? Yes, yes, let's do that. Would you lead us? Okay, so we'll begin with the Hail Mary, uh, Mary being the seat of wisdom. Yes. Hail Mary, full of grace, Hail the grace. Lord is with thee. With blessed art thou amongst women, woman. and blessed is the fruit of, of thy womb. Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, Mother of God. Pray for us for sinners, sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. So, perhaps it, when it comes to concluding, you can lead the final prayer. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so let's, let's go ahead. <laughs> okay. The um, title of the book, Lord, Do You Mean Me? Um, expresses really that while it's true and understood that becoming a parent entails becoming a teacher of the faith, nevertheless, uh, we can feel either completely unprepared for it or uh, really unsuitable. And in a certain way, I think this question, uh, Lord, do you mean me? shows itself in the events. The fact is, if we didn't have eight children, uh, mm -hmm. possibly it wouldn't be required of me. But the very fact of a growing family mm -hmm. and uh, our call to celebrate Lords, for example, together with the children, really plunged us into, my wife and I, plunged us into gathering the children as they came and as they got older. And from very early on, plunged us into uh, this challenge of transmitting the faith. And one of the earliest uh, lessons, in a sense, is one of the fathers, I think, of the church says, be aware of what's going on, but don't correct everything. And I think that was... I was very slow learning that because when you've got children who are very close to each other, ours now are 15 to 25. So mm -hmm. they fall really very closely with each other. And one sets off another, as you can imagine, <laughs> uh, <laughs> with all kinds of face pulling and disruption and over banging or over singing or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And, um, I remember particularly there was a, a time when, uh, as we were working through the entire scripture, starting from the Old Testament, we were encouraged to choose passages right through the entire scriptures. So we did. And there was this one particular passage I distinctly remember, whereby uh, Eli, who has two sons, um, and they're entitled to a portion as they were priests looking after the uh, temple. But the commentary of the text was that they took the portion of God. And in a, for some reason, this struck me particularly uh, because I could be very um, uh, overreact a lot in terms of the sort of disruption of the children. And this word really spoke to me very clearly about not taking the portion of the children, not from the point of view of the children themselves being disruptive, but from the point of view of me not overreacting to them. So this word, which we so depend upon to enlighten us, um, was really for my benefit in the first place. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that in a way has grown on me is there's a saying by um, St. Jerome, ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. But there is a corollary of that, which is ignorance of Christ is ignorance of God and man, male and female. 
So this relationship to the word uh, opens up both in terms of who God is, who Christ is, and who the Blessed Trinity is, as it were, but it also opens up the other way in terms of who we are. And this um, invitation then to see who I am as discovered by the word of God is very different to me just thinking about myself and my suitability, because in terms of um, this word that calls me uh, to be a catechist, I mean, my starting point was well behind the starting line because um, my own relationship to my father very much came to the fore while the children were still small. At the time, I was commuting uh, to Birmingham. I was working in Birmingham and I live in Cheltenham. And this commuting on the train um, grew into an opportunity, really, to look at the wisdom literature on fatherhood. And one of the things that struck me very clearly, uh, because I didn't find it easy to kind of ease into fatherhood, if you like, um, being 40, uh, when I married at 40, I was, if you like, a lot less flexible than uh, a younger man and uh, a lot more full of hidden uh, reactions, really, mm -hmm. these sort of overreactions. And so I took to this uh, time of traveling um, at other times for studying but also, and writing, but also for scrutinizing this wisdom literature because it had a lot to say. And one of the things that, that became clear, Eli had two sons and they were entitled to a portion of what was brought to the temple. But they took the portion of God, as it was called. And what struck me in, in that reading was it was really for my benefit, rather more from the children's, that uh, if I overreacted to their silliness and kind of in a way natural restlessness mm -hmm. i was taking that portion of god and so it was very helpful to me uh, on the one hand it's necessary to be aware of what was going on but on mm -hmm. the other hand you know this wisdom of letting a lot pass uh, was far more beneficial because after all we were there with the listening to the word of god not to me remonstrating with uh, over silliness and even now uh when we come together uh that they're older still um they are capable of this uh silliness even <laughs> though and uh, how much more important it is not not to lose the purpose of being <laughs> there, which is to let this word of god speak and it does and at mm -hmm. different times, there uh, there is uh, a response from them. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was very much about gathering this wisdom that I needed. And one of the opportunities was, while I was commuting, um, was to search the scriptures. And there was a lot in the wisdom literature that I found particularly helpful because it engaged me in thinking about my own experience of uh, being a son, which was not at all helpful to my father. I mean, he um, was bringing up seven children and he often took on an old house and worked on it. Uh, but I was far from cooperative. So in many respects, you know, I was far worse than my own children in terms of being unwilling to help. Uh, we as a family were too disruptive, apparently, for my parents to do morning prayer with us. So we were, if you like, further afield than my own children in terms of being, uh, what should we say, uh, callable or approachable. Um, mm -hmm. So I was uh, far and away more of a challenge to my parents than uh, our children were to me, and that was already a grace. Now, I was reasonably reconciled with my parents before they died, but 
still what struck me in the scriptures in this wisdom literature was how foundational a good relationship to uh, a person's own parents is being able to be a parent uh, mm -hmm. myself and that really caused me to pray really to ask mm -hmm. god uh, for forgiveness um to uh and to really seek that change of heart that we call conversion you know and um it really is um a demand on me as a parent and so uh my wife and i have adopted a strategy as it were above um my wife's head in the dining room where we celebrate lords there is a picture of the holy family and particularly of joseph so my first reaction was uh constantly as i looked at this picture to ask for help <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, from saint joseph and uh to dwell on saint joseph and his uh paternity as it were his fatherhood but then um we adopted also as we were preparing this uh reading because as i said earlier we we're working through the old testament right through the scriptures we're now at the acts of the apostles and so prior to gathering the children we my wife and i have decided on a reading but we've also adopted um praying a decade so that mm -hmm. it helps us to ask our lady um to give us a good disposition give me a good disposition for um engaging with the children in morning prayer so really um this whole call to conversion you know to turn away from the tendency to overreact um and to find that wisdom of don bosco you know he, he says lots of things that are really helpful i mean for mm -hmm. example um when it comes to difficulties with the children he says you know say less and pray more you know don't burden <laughs> them with uh, a lecture but uh say less and pray more mm -hmm so gathering this wisdom you know fortunately having uh returned to the church and being uh formed this formation uh mm -hmm. is actually very full because we're introduced to the prayer of the church mm -hmm. but also to the fathers of the church and even when it's not explicitly to do with parents there is often a wisdom there so for example one of the uh fathers says that if among the brothers he's obviously speaking as an abbot in a community and he says if one of the brothers um has a problem look to yourself as the father of the community as it were to see you know if there's grounds within how you're treating this particular brother and that that is often really helpful you know if there's a problem arises instead of you know automatically thinking in terms of the child and the the child's problem uh, mm -hmm. rather the other way around uh looking for a better approach myself mm -hmm. i mean i can remember uh one of our daughters found it really difficult to get up and my mother had said at some point um about the use of chocolate when we were small so instead of remonstrating with a about getting up in time for morning prayer i started taking up a chocolate biscuit and of course it made the world a difference uh, you know just I the like that. approach is different <laughs> yeah. you know between mm -hmm. offering a chocolate biscuit as opposed to you know why can't you get up you know mm -hmm. uh, if you want to start you know yeah. this whole kind of impatience and uh, overreaction so uh, mm -hmm. uh, many many small changes um are necessary uh and, and that's what comes across i think in uh deciding to write a book is actually it there are many small changes that are necessary uh for fathers in order to adapt to their children you know whatever time of life uh mm -hmm. children come into the family um this willingness to adapt and that can also obviously involve language 
you know, um, I mean, uh, as our children got older or get older and argue, uh, drawing on physics, you know, for example, um, on the one hand, you know, it can be very instructive having a dialogue about, are we just physical particles? Mm -hmm. And to some extent, you can think about the physics of it, you know, in terms of, mm -hmm. well, uh, a telephone call is principally um, a transmission using electrons and electrical activity. But there's no content if you just think about it from the point of view of the electrical transmission. Whereas actually, you know, our conversations on the telephone aren't about the passage of electrons. It, they are about the content, yeah. you know, especially um, bringing them up at university and asking them how they're getting on. Mm -hmm. So um, philosophically, for a child to reduce everything to physics enters this contradiction that mm -hmm. on the one hand, it's true, physics is a vehicle of all kinds of communication, mm -hmm. and the phone is a good illustration. But on the other hand, it doesn't account for meaning. And the right. meaning uh, that we express when we have a discussion about mm -hmm. you know, in what does a human being consist. And this particular son, uh, at a certain point, uh, said, well, it, there obviously then must be more to us than the physics. Mm -hmm. So it was just an opening, as it were. Mm -hmm. But also uh, the science can go in a different direction. You know, if a person in this electronic age is really um, preoccupied with the videos, with the, mm -hmm. the TikTok, with the online availability of films of one kind or another, you know, uh, if also he's attending university, you know, there is the possibility of the imagery uh, being invoked. So, for example, um, you know, being able to get to lectures is mm -hmm. that like swimming with a t television tied to your foot mm -hmm. you know because the relationship to the availability of technology can really you know sink a person in mm -hmm. terms of the time it swallows literally yeah or you know alternatively um having a compass and finding that actually there's a magnet stuck to the side of the compass which is completely derailing its sense of direction mm -hmm. so as um time goes on i think this willingness both on the one hand to draw on the word of god and on mm -hmm. the other hand to be flexible in terms of the different ways that we can communicate uh with our children mm -hmm. um makes makes a demand that I think is both good for the parent, but also it helps the child to engage. And uh, indeed, um, can it, the child can even appreciate the different kind of imagery uh, and, and see the point that is being made, but perhaps in a, a relatively mild way. And, and that, I think, has to be, you know, taking up, uh, St. Francis de Sales, you know, what is better, honey or vinegar? So, you know, this sense of something being uh, helpfully put, you know, requires, yeah. you know, the wisdom of God, frankly. And mm -hmm. it, it even makes me think of the origin of the word persuasion. Um, I discovered not too long ago that to persuade means to sweeten, mm -hmm. actually that the word comes from a root meaning to sweeten. And in terms of St. Francis de Sales, you know, which is better, honey or vinegar, you know, clearly to be able to sweeten um, an, an argument or a point of view or an observation about how someone is, mm -hmm. is it, more likely, I wouldn't say it's certain because that depends on this grace of receptivity, but it's more likely to dispose a person to listen. Mm -hmm. So in terms of uh, all the variety of what a person can bring, I think, you know, acknowledging one's own history so that, uh, you know, if, for example, a child is struggling and fails an exam, mm -hmm. 
actually I have several examples of courses that I left because mm -hmm. um, the failures pointed in a different direction. Yeah. Um, so, for example, I had a, an interview at a university to do music, but I failed uh, to convince the interviewer that I was ready for a course. And I remember coming out of that interview really freed, you know, the bubble had burst. I can sing, but <laughs> I'm, I'm not really competent at uh, playing an instrument or reading music. And so the bubble had burst. And mm -hmm. I came out of that interview really freed from this preoccupation of e a couple of years, you know, learning instruments, playing, trying to play the guitar, trying to play mm -hmm. the saxophone, really freed. And so when, uh, likewise, you know, I hear that, you know, one of the children has failed an exam, it's far from a negative thing because sometimes it's being pointed away from something is the only way we can discover the direction we need to go in. Mm -hmm. so, um, one of the chapters uh, later in the book is very much about nothing is wasted in the hands of God. Nothing mm -hmm. is wasted either in our own lives or in the lives of our children uh, because God is the great recycler. It's a bit of a, a terrible way of putting it. Mm -hmm. but nothing, nothing is wasted in the hands of God. You know, whether it's um, my own sinfulness and how God has acted, which makes it really clear that God needs to act. You know, so mm -hmm. when we're, if you like, communicating this um, Christian faith, we're really waiting on God to act, just as in my own life. You know, when I was 40 and unable to marry and unable to, uh, complete a course or find a vocation. Uh, you know, there was a certain moment when uh, I was in the basement flat of my parents' house. I'd returned home. Uh, yet another relationship had failed and fallen through. And there seemed to me three possibilities, suicide, sin, or mental illness. And mm -hmm. it was at that point, because I'd started studying theology, mm -hmm. um, I was reading the catechism. And in a completely new way, I read, um, if God can create everything out of nothing, he can make a new beginning for that sinner. And mm -hmm. that's being me. Now, there was something about that word which passed through in a way that had never happened before. I mean, I can remember going on a pilgrimage uh, and meeting as one of million, uh, Pope John Paul II in Denver, Colorado. And I can remember him reading the gospel and it's saying, uh, and he's reading the words of Christ, I come to give you life and life to the full. But it wasn't until this um, moment of the catechism freeing me from the fact that I didn't have to deny that I was a sinner. On the contrary, it was a foundation for being able to listen to God as uh, a saviour, as Jesus Christ. So the difference was this hearing this was freeing, you know, that I, I didn't have to be anything other than what I was, which was a mess uh, mm -hmm. and a sinner. And mm -hmm. this word of God being the creator, mm -hmm. completely without any effort on my part, completely changed my life. Mm -hmm. Because within a year, I'd married and I'd mm -hmm. been unable to marry. I'd had several possible relationships that could have approached marriage, but never did. Even mm -hmm. um, got close to uh, marrying in a registry office, which is the kind of legal minimum but not even being able to manage that and mm -hmm. so this word had passed to me in a way that was completely new because it brought a change that wasn't from me mm -hmm. i wasn't capable of this change but because of this change marriage 
was possible and not only possible but transpired over the next mm -hmm. 12 months and so whenever communicating with the children i became very conscious that really if there is no act of god what are we doing you know we are really hoping always in this act of god so um there's an expression called the moral miracle and it disposes a person to listen so one of the uh, endeavors as parents and particularly myself is not hiding the reality of my history not hiding um what god has been doing because it's precisely that that has the possibility of preparing their listening of mm -hmm. preparing the ground for god to act so um while on the one hand there is this preparation of a word and following the uh prayer of the church on in sunday lords on the other hand there is this uh, endeavor to open the ear by uh, really speaking honestly uh, and hopefully in a fruitful way about the reality of my own life and that my mm -hmm. wife speaking about her, the reality of her life that it, it's clear that both that god has acted in our lives but also mm -hmm. that this is necessary in the transmission of faith in the family that it can't be as it were doctrinal while mm -hmm. doctrine is necessary uh, for the coherence and understanding of what we do it isn't a substitute for recognizing this action of god in our lives i mean even you know you think of abraham who was in his 70s when god called him out of ur and i can remember long before i married in my 20s driving around in a car full of tools because i was doing maintenance work and i was in the habit of the rosary not really knowing what prayer was but praying all the same mm -hmm. quite unexpectedly um it was like a passage of scripture came to mind um what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul and here i was driving along earning more money than i'd ever earned which wasn't a fantastic amount but it was about 60 pounds a day and 20p a mile but it was the sense in which it was taking me up and this word of scripture um i didn't expect an answer I don't know what I thought prayer was, but I was in the habit of it while I drove around. And this word of scripture set me in motion, like Abraham, for some reason, um, like Abraham, I heard it as not just a biblical prompt, but in some sense as being spoken to and addressed. <laughs> and i abandoned what i was doing went to london and started looking for spiritual direction now it took many years i mean this was the difference between my 20s and eventually 40. um so i was very hard of hearing you might say indeed and um god did many things in the course of that time but without the scriptures um i don't think we can understand the action of god it's only now having come into a, a way of formation that draws so much on the biblical word mm -hmm. that so much of my life makes sense and so much of the possibilities of what goes on in the lives of the children uh, mm -hmm. can be uh if you like prepared for because just as i began to find this word of abraham making sense of this sudden scriptural call while i was driving along um so hopefully in the the scriptural foundation that we're giving our children that mm -hmm. they will begin to hear something that identifies their situation in relation to a biblical figure mm -hmm. uh, whether it's abraham or um whatever it is and so we're always in a way not only working in the dark 
because, uh, but only in this sense that um, we don't know at what point God will act or even if he is acting at that moment and it may not show itself for some time. But clearly there's a dependence on God. And I think that that sort of is very humbling, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. on the one hand, you know, we do as we can as parents. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, to be conscious means also, you know, to get up in the night and to pray that God will open the ear of our children. He will mm -hmm. guide them in ways that uh, we may have failed to do so. Um, but nevertheless, our dependence on him is greater than, if you like, our power of persuasion to talk the children into the existence of God or, or mm -hmm. to, um, if you like, interpret their lives on their behalf. Rather more the other way around, you know, that we present the scriptures, we present um, our experience, we present all the different elements that one can as a parent, you know, household mm -hmm. skills and scientific discussions and uh, working in the garden or whatever it is, baking. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you know, to be constantly humbled by the fact that if God doesn't act, there will be no fruit. And so this kind of readiness to mm -hmm. depend on God, I think really mm -hmm. Uh, so fundamental so one of the if you like ongoing threads throughout the book is always this recourse to the word of god so while it uh, you know there are chapters for example on an introduction you know to philosophy for parents or an introduction <laughs> to theology for parents you know the the whole book is if you like uh, premised on if there is no action of God, would any of this be fruitful anyway? They may end up well informed, they may end up well versed in a variety of arguments, but will they actually have been introduced to the living God if <laughs> God himself doesn't act, if we don't communicate on that basis that really we as parents are hoping every day in the, uh, the act of God or the action mm -hmm. of God in their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I've had an interesting experience myself because I converted uh, into Catholicism and it was because I was in Rome, which is a long story I won't give you, <laughs> but um, I was in Rome in the catacombs and I just um, had like this ticker tape go through my mind. Literally, I could just like a, with words on it that said um, the church is where the truth is found. And the T was capitalized in truth, which meant nothing to me <laughs> for a long while. But the reason that I converted was because I knew I didn't do that. That came from somewhere else. You know, right. there was, it was like there was no way ever in the world that I would just suddenly imagine the ticker tape going through my brain saying the truth is the truth is found in the church. It's like, what does that mean? So, you know, I, so I understand what you're saying when you say you get that, um, you know, that you get God's initiative and it really helps us it change my whole life. <laughs> You know, and it sounds like, you know, it, it sounds like it ultimately changed all of yours. It's it's amazing. Well, it is. And it's also yeah. confirmed by others. I yeah. mean, um, when we were on a pilgrimage to Krakow uh, in Poland to meet Pope Francis for the World Youth Day uh, mm -hmm. meeting in Poland, mm -hmm. uh, I was given the task of um, a catechesis on Edith Stein. And... It looked like it wasn't going to happen. Uh, we were going through Auschwitz at the time, and it just beautifully still and quiet. I mean, a most extraordinary place in contrast to what went on. And I remember saying to the, the leader of the pilgrimage, um, this is the one woman on the programme, as it were. When, when is it going to be possible to talk about it? At the same time, I was really 
uh, nervous and was constantly reading what I could to prepare. As it happened, we eventually arrived at a Carmelite convent in Poland. And lo and behold, he turned around and said to me, the leader of the pilgrimage, now's, your, now's the time for the catechesis on Edith Stein. And I really took it as this was a gift from her. It wasn't just mm -hmm. incidental that we were in a mm -hmm. Carmelite convent. It was mm -hmm. uh, really from her because she was a, she entered the Carmelite order. Now, the, uh, what happened to you reminded me of what happened to her. She mm -hmm. developed her Jewish faith at 15, but mm -hmm. she always regarded, certainly in her latter life, the pursuit of truth as a kind of trail of prayer, mm -hmm. that prayer and the pursuit of truth were somehow intimately linked. And mm -hmm. according to St. Thomas Aquinas, any action in the pursuit of truth is an action of the Holy Spirit. So mm -hmm. it, there is actually um, a lot to unfold there. But she mm -hmm. was there um, mm -hmm. by now, having gone from being a 15-year-old who abandoned her Jewish faith, to being uh, a young woman who was studying under one of the leading philosophers of the day. Um, and she was in the house of a Christian family and she picked a book off the shelf. I think uh, she was there for the evening and she picked off a, a book by St. Teresa of Avila. Uh -huh. and she that the truth is a person. Mm. That person Jesus Christ, I am the way, mm -hmm. the life, the truth. Yeah. And she read that book from cover to cover overnight. And the following day, she wanted, and maybe in the course of it even, she wanted to become a Catholic. Mm -hmm. She saw right through yeah. to the coherence of mm -hmm. uh, the truth being a person. And uh, so quite unprecedented in a way. I mean, she hadn't superficially being looking as far as uh, she said uh, to become a Christian but mm -hmm. that discovery of the truth being a person mm -hmm. uh, what led her into the church mm -hmm. and it sounds like you were given if you like a, mm -hmm. a question um, yeah. that presumably you started to ask yourself about you know mm -hmm. what is the nature of this truth that is to be found in the church mm -hmm. yeah as soon as i got back from rome um i had my husband who was catholic uh he uh i had him call his parish priest so i could start to talk about converting right <laughs> I, you know it was amazing yeah <laughs> it really was you know it's like you look at it it's like whoa and i end up to be a theologian <laughs> think yeah. about that <laughs> yeah you so, know, it's just, yeah. So what took you right into theology then? Was um, I, I studied with the priest, uh, the local parish priest. He had taught one course at the school that I ended up going to to learn theology. And he had just received a registration form like the day before. So he gave me the registration form and he said, here, I think you should go here. So, you know, I started as soon as I converted. That summer, I went down to Holy Apostles. I was there as a student. They sent. They said, "Oh, you should go get a license." It's like, okay, what's that? You know, I, you know. So I got a ninety credit MA from them. They sent me. Uh, they didn't pay for it, of course, but they they said go off to Dominican House in Washington. I was there for two years, got my license, and then as soon as I was done there, they offered me a job, and I worked for them for twenty eight years, training priests and sisters and seminarians and lay people. All because I went to the catacombs on vacation because my husband wanted to take his mother for her 85th birthday to Rome. Right, right. <laughs> I do like remember it, you telling me previously that you were going to stay in the coach. Yes, I was. And, and I that, didn't because there was no air conditioning or bathroom. Right. So... <laughs> It was as a result of getting out of the coach that then yes, this then followed. Yes, yes. It's, yeah. it's unbelievable. I mean, I, I look at the one decision. I'm going to go in there because it looks like it's cooler in there than in this bus with no air conditioning. My whole life changed. Yeah. Permanently. Yeah. It's, um, it's 
you know, I tell people that that aren't Catholic and they look at me like I've lost my mind. But when I tell devout Catholics, they understand. Yeah. It still makes me so happy. I kind of laugh when I'm telling the story because it just is, yeah. it's a thing of joy. Yeah. 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 So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. One of these words, when um, when finally, uh, having proposed during the sign of peace in the mm -hmm. Eucharist to uh, the woman who was to become my wife, mm -hmm. she said um, something along the lines, um, after a bit. Anyway, that after a bit turned out to be not too many months, so... Uh, mm -hmm. On the morning of October the 19th, when we mm -hmm. were of our wedding, it was a beautiful October morning mm -hmm. here in England, very bright mm -hmm. and sunny, and the colours are just fantastic this time of year in England. And one of these words, if you like, ran across mm -hmm. as I was stood outside the door of the flat, this basement flat that mm -hmm. uh, I was living in. And it said that this poor man called and the Lord heard him. And it's it's been foundational for me in terms of entering marriage that mm -hmm. uh, as a, a word from God, mm -hmm. uh, he took pity on me, having mm -hmm. seen so many ruined and wrecked relationships. Yeah. Um, he answered this poor man's cry mm -hmm. and uh, made it possible for me to marry. And uh, that was one of those scriptural words, if you like, mm -hmm. that runs like ticker yeah. tape. It's, it, and I, the I, yeah, I actually had it happen twice. I was on my way to study at Albertus Magnus to get an MFA in creative writing. I don't know in, in your country, but in, in this country, it is considered a terminal degree. So I was driving down and I didn't know, did I want to write pro-life fiction? Or did I run write my memoir? And all of a sudden, I mean, the same ticker tape went through my head and it said, write nonfiction. It's like, okay, I get it. <laughs> I'm not even going to question it this time. <laughs> right. So, and so I wrote my memoir, which I think I had told you about. Um, but it, it is basically pro-life because uh, my mother had tried to chemically abort me in 1949 and told me right. um and so i i it's to me it's a very pro-life memoir but right. um you know it came out of nowhere it's like it's not like i'm thinking i could use a ticker tape now it's like it just shoo, twice in my life and you know it's it's amazing mm. Mm. So, yeah a word of um, God. yeah it's true shall we close Good. in prayer Yes, your turn okay. to lead the prayer. Okay. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. Thy will, thy be, will done be done. On earth, on earth as, as it is, it is in, heaven. in heaven. Give, Give us this day, this day our, our daily, daily bread. And forgive us. Forgive us our trespasses. Our trespasses. As, as we forgive, forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. In the Father and the Son and the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Okay. Well, thank you, Francis. God bless. Okay. Yeah. Take care. Yeah. Bye. We'll talk again soon, I hope. <laughs> I hope. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah.